my pleasure to introduce our panelists and, and get into this in-depth conversation. I feel very honored to have been um, in my role as Executive Vice President for NACA at the beginning of some of these programs and certainly even before these programs were even conceived. And to see where we are now, about 10 years into the first one, uh, really, really makes it feel like you're part of something important and have been a part of something important. And all of these uh, individuals up here, I believe, feel the same way. So we'll start from the end and go this way. Acting, and he's loving every minute of it, <laughs> Vice President of uh, Safety and, and Technical Training, Jeffrey Vincent. <laughs> NACA's Chairman for Safety, Steve Hansen. <laughs> NACA's Professional Standards uh, Rep, Garth Polazar. And his FAA counterpart could not be here today. He, uh, although he's got a couple counterparts because he's involved in a couple initiatives, but the one that we were gonna bring on stage to, to discuss the, the initiative today with him is actually the manager at O'Hare Tower and had an, an issue come up that he just couldn't make it. So he sends his regrets. Uh, next to him is, you guys all know, Jason Demogoski, human performance. <laughs> human performance manager. He actually wanted to walk up on stage to some walk-up music. <laughs> and next to him is NACA's uh, national representative, his counterpart, Jay Barrett. And next to him is a lovely Chrissy Pageant out of Washington Center, who's our national uh, partnership for safety uh, representative. And her counterpart, Ernesto Larson, who's uh, manager of safety work groups. Did I, get, I think I... Group Manager for Safety. <laughs> so we're going to get started. Um, the concepts that we're going to we're going to discuss today are all under the umbrella of part of foundations of professionalism. Um, it's very interesting when you finally get to a point as an agency and as a workforce where you want to institute a collaborative. Co a culture, a collaborative culture and processes that you're able to go outside of the traditional way of working together and create initiatives that really could bring long lasting effects, not just for the workers in the system, but for the people that we, that fly through the system. So we're going to start with the one that's been out the, and around the longest, 10 year anniversary this year is ATSAP. And we're going to start with Steve Hansen and Jeffrey Vincent to talk a little bit about the voluntary safety reporting programs that we have in place, place not just for air traffic controllers, but for our contract towers and uh, the other bargaining units in the FAA. Thanks. Um, so, at SAP, uh, 10 years ago, March of 2008, um, we certainly had a, a fun time of implementing and uh, making our way through the system and, and making that, and by 2010, we were fully implemented across the country. Um, since then, um, we've had about 140,000 reports, give or take. We get about 300 to 350 a week, um, and about 184 corrective action requests, which is the formal method for identifying um, safety issues and elevating those to the vice president the, whatever the vice president is, right? It depends. If it's an air traffic issue, it goes to the AJT vice president. If it's a, a PMO issue or an equipment issue, it still might go to the air traffic vice president, be, but get support from the PMO vice president um, and myself. And then we delegate it down to the people that can actually work the issue. So 184 of those, most of those, I would say less than half of them have been fully resolved. Um, most of them are in the process. A lot of them take forever to work because they're, some of them are big ticket items. Uh, one of the, one that, kind of comes to mind um, as a really big success, and I didn't bring the slides with me, but um, down in the Miami Center, they have the Caribbean, right? And there's no weather radar down there. So they're working airplanes in there, there's always some sort of accident or fatal accident or something going on every year, right? So the car was issued and we called it uh, access to current weather for Miami Center. We quickly realized that that was a bigger issue than Miami Center. It was Miami Center, it was Houston Center, it was New York Center, and actually, about, I think there's nine centers that could actually benefit from this because there's blind spots in their weather radar. Um, but initially, um, the vice president for en route said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do anything, we're going to accept the risk and we're going to move on because it's just too much money. Because turning on a weather radar, installing a weather radar out in the Caribbean on an island and maintaining it costs tens of millions of dollars. So we're not going to do anything. 
So we find out, myself and Tom Adcock, who is from Miami Center and the training rep uh, for NACA, went and talked to Greg Burke, who was the VP at the time, and Terry Biggio, who was the deputy, and said, this is a big issue. This is a major issue. Weather is an important part of our work, and we're going to tell Miami that, no, you can't have weather radar. Continue to do as you're doing. Um, so what they did is they actually thought outside the box. We found some people working at uh, an AJV who had an idea of using lightning data to create a picture of what the weather really looks like. Among other things, right, that's the main piece that kind of um, fits in there. And now at Houston, Miami, and New York, in the command center, there is a display in the, in the area that works those offshore areas that shows the weather depiction so they can use it for um, information. The next step is to put it on the glass. And that right now is like a seven year process, seven to eight year process, but they're trying to speed that up. But anyway, <coughs> we went from zero, this is a 2011 car, right? It was issued in 2011. Seven years later, we have a display. Now, eight years later, we might have it on the glass. Slow progress, but progress, right? So that's one of the bigger things. Um, we, some other cars that were issued were um, around the weather phraseology and the fourth line data block and the special use airspace and weather, which there's an appendix in the point .65 now because of that. Um, and simple things like a tower cab window that's broken and continues to get fogged up and controllers can't see out the window. Just simple things like that. There's probably four or five of those. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff coming out of uh, ADSAP. And we try to focus on all of those things that are going well. Because we all know it's somewhat controversial at times about how things are dealt with. The overall thing is we deal with safety issues. We're going to have these one-off issues that become really controversial. Every year we have one, if not two. But that's about it, and they make their way around the system, and oh my God, the system is going down because ATSAP has done something bad. That's not true. I mean, and we, as I assume everybody in here is some sort of leader within your organization, your facility, have a type of responsibility to make sure that everybody understands the purpose of ATSAP is really to learn from our mistakes and fix safety issues. And as long as we stick with those tenants, we're gonna be fine. And it's doing its job, it really is. Not only with ATSAP, but we have, now we have ASAP with all of the FCTs, three different ASAP programs within the FCTs. Um, we have ATSAP X, which is a program for the engineers, um, the air traffic system specialists within the service centers, the flight procedures group, and the quality, quality uh, control specialists within the service centers. And we also have an aircraft certification safety reporting program. So we have this across the system where we have voluntary safety reporting and people are learning from their mistakes. And that's really what these programs are all about. Are things going to fall through the cracks? Sure. I mean, anybody who thinks anything is perfect is, is mistaken. Um, I will leave it there and I will let Jeffrey take it from here. Thank you. Uh, you heard Steve talk about some of the uh, great attributes from the uh, ATSAP program. Uh, one of the things that I hope to do while I'm here in AJI is to take that further. You know, we are certainly celebrating the, the 10 year anniversary of ATSAP, but where can we go from here? You know, has the program been fully embraced? Um, just shortly uh, removed from the field about four months ago, you know, I can honestly say that I don't think that we've all fully embraced the, uh, the attributes of ATSAP and the benefits that we get from a true voluntary safety uh, reporting program. So one of the things that you're gonna see out of me while I'm here is uh, trying to get back out there in, in the field uh, reinvigorate the, the program, um, make sure that people really, really understand what it's all about. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> I think a lot of times people um, uh, will use the term, it's some type of uh, immunity type program when Steve was talking about the negative, and we certainly know that it's, it's much, much more than that. And those are the attributes that we would like to promote. So if uh, the, the, the information, you know, that we're getting uh, as, as people sit down and voluntarily tell you, you know, what's going on, what's happening in the facility, uh, and don't feel like uh, it's some type of a, a punitive process. So I think the 10 years, it, it's been wonderful to see us remove, um, move from a reporting culture. I think most of us that in the room that were controls, we certainly do remember uh, the stigma and what it was like in, in those days. Uh, I think we're much better for that now. Certainly our number of reports and things like that are going up, so some of our stakeholders you know, might have a little bit different view. 
But I think overall the system has benefited tremendously from that program. So I hope to uh, continue that. I hope to be able to move that forward. Uh, you know, if there's um, any time anyone from AJI or our organization can come out, talk to your um, folks in your organizations, we'd absolutely love the opportunity to be able to do that. And before we move down the line, and maybe I'm, you're going to talk about what I'm going to ask you, which can you kind of discuss the nexus between the safety reporting that we get and then how we create the curriculum for recurrent training? The second piece is Bridget, and, Bridget G. And, and James Fee were here earlier. They talked about wrong surface landings, which is a, a bigger issue uh, than we've seen in, in the past. Can you kind of talk about how the voluntary safety reportings affected the data that they're getting there? Well, I mean, that's a has fundamentally changed how we operate. I mean, there's no question about it. It's become the backbone to a lot of different things. It includes recurrent training. All of the topics, I mean, how many of you, one, just to get an idea of everybody here, everybody's in a facility, the controllers, you're in a facility, so you do recurrent training. All of the recurrent training topics are derived from the reporting topics, the, thing, the items that are reported by controllers and frontline managers or whoever is reporting, right? So, those topics are the topics that are reported. They're not just made up, we don't just make them up. We look at the data, we talk to ATSAP, we talk to the program, and we come up with the topics based on data, right? So and when people say, oh, recurrent training didn't do anything, well, guess what? That's everything that's been reported by the people that are working the boards. So it should be very relevant to you. To you. And you need to, as it's, pushed out into the facility and you're doing the instructor-led training or the web-based training, it, it's the instructor-led training, make it local, right? Well, how does this impact us local? There's certainly a curriculum and a guide, but you can make that stuff local. And that goes to partnership for safety, too. All of those monthly safe discussions, who does those? Raise your hands. Who does the monthly safe discussions? The LSC. The LSC. Well, the, safe, the monthly safe discussions is a mandatory monthly face-to-face -face discussion with the information that Partnership for Safety puts out. And I'm going to leave it at that because I know Chrissy wants to talk about that. And I don't want to steal that. But, um, was that that funny? No, just the mic. <laughs> I forgot I had the mic. Um, Go ahead, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> but, We're here all week, so. Thank you. Um, all of these things are tied together. And ATSAP has really become a sought after data source whether it's an SMS panel, a national SMS panel, a facility local level SMS panel, it doesn't matter. ATSAP data feeds a lot of different things, whether it's the top five, the recurrent training, um, I already mentioned the partnership for safety discussions, um, and that, those are big things. Those fundamentally changed how we operate. And some of them still need work and we need to continue to work on them, no question, but it has changed the way we do business. I'll just plug the sharing that we do with the, the pilot community and airlines is Yes, we have, thank you. We have agreements with 24 airlines where we share our ASAP and our ATSAP data back and forth called the Confidential Information Share Program and two dispatch programs as well. So all this information goes, is shared widely through ASIAS, through CAS, through all of these big ticket organizations that, and, and groups that make decisions about safety. So the reporting is important. He has nothing to add. Okay, we'll go to Garth since he's already mic'd up and ready to go. We're going to talk a little bit about professional standards, which now has been around about nine years, right? Yeah, we started in um, February of 2009 having dialogue about creating a professional standards program. Um, and we had really no idea where to go. So we uh, got a hold of uh, ALPA's professional standard team and said, hey, can, can you help us? So. We reached out to them, we went through their training, um, and they'd have a program in place at the time for about 50 years. And, and so it was a great foundation for us to be able to say, okay, where do we go from here? Now the challenge for us was significantly different in that most of their stuff is, is crew resource issues. And so if you have two pilots in conflict, um, their challenge was only to get them to agree with each other for a couple of days, whatever that rotation looked like. Um, for us, it's significantly different because if Steve and I are working in a facility together and we have a conflict or an issue, we've got to resolve that for 20 years. So it was, it was a much bigger challenge, and our workforce was a, a little bit different. Uh, and, and so we started to build kind of our own system around who we were as safety professionals on this side of the frequency. 
um, not just controllers, but everybody in the operation, those who support the operation, engineers, architects, et cetera, um, as we move that forward. The title of, of this particular panel is Foundations of Professionalism, and it's what we recognized and how we got to that terminology was we recognized that really all of these programs are connected. Um, and some of the recurrent training stuff, I think, if you've taken this iteration, there's a lot of professional standards piece in that. Um, I, you know, I'll get a request from Partnership for Safety to, to add stuff about professionalism, and, and we'll talk about the tie-in with ADSAP. So recognizing that all these programs are related, we, we wanted to see if we couldn't build synergy between them, manage resources a little bit better, and really overall work uh, towards a unified goal to protect the safety of the system. And I'd like to talk a little bit about culture change sometimes, because it takes a long time to change a culture. It's not something that you can do overnight. It's not simply run a video out there or get people in front of people. It takes time. But if you think about our organization, in the last decade has been significant, because we've really looked at that human component. And I know Jay will talk about human factors. But prior to that, it was all equipment or technology or procedures. But now we're talking about people which is the critical component of any of that. You can put any piece of equipment out there, but unless you have that professional to run it, we don't, we don't get there. So that's a significant culture change over the last decade. Our workforce, half of our workforce have never known anything without ATSAP. That's, that's just what it is. That's, that's what they know. Um, they don't know a thing without professional standards. They don't know a thing without fully charged or human factors or partnership for safety. That's how we get that, that culture change. So we're making significant strides in, in that area. And when we talk about professional standards, it's really two components. There's a component that says, if I as an individual have a professional challenge or issue, can it be addressed in a, in a way that's effective? And so we go out and we train individuals to operate within a particular facility to manage that. We teach psychology, um, uh, human factors, traits as far as recognizing different personality traits, how to overcome conflict. And I'll show a video here in, in just a little bit that talks about some of our successes for that. So that's the, that's the individual component. But the, it also has an organizational component as far as who we are as a group of professionals to say, what's, what's our goal and can we codify that? I know that if I asked all of you individually to pick five items that describe professionalism, you're all gonna come up, there'll be some similarities, but you'll come up with a, a lot of different uh, uh, definitions. So we wanted to codify that into three very simple pieces. How do we maintain public trust, right? The belief that they have that when they put their family into that seat, they don't have to worry about it. And I think that's a significant piece. How do we take an opportunity to mentor each other to move forward? I believe that there's no piece of equipment, there's no rule change, there's nothing that anybody can put into the system that moves us forward as a group of professionals other than the choices that we each make every single day when we sit in the, in the seat for our particular um, occupation. And, and, and so how do we do that? You know, as a controller, I'm gonna, you know, and when I sat in front of somebody who trained me, they passed their craft to me. And we do that in every facility across the country. We put somebody in a seat in front of us and we pass our craft to them. And so that happens all throughout the system. So how do I take that responsibility and move that forward? And the last one really goes to my individual responsibility uh, to maintain the image of the profession as a whole. And so organizationally, when we follow those three doctrines, it's very easy for us to go down that path as, as far as professionals of where we're gonna go, how do we get behind that, why do we talk about uh, certain things, uh, et cetera. And now we find that we're really moving forward in the system, those concepts of professionalism. <laughs> Professional Standards has had an opportunity uh, to go out to other countries and, and train them as well. We've uh, had an opportunity to go out to New Zealand uh, several times and start their program. Um, we're working with uh, the UK controllers to hopefully get theirs going, as well as uh, we're starting dialogue with some of uh, uh, CADCAs from NAV Canada uh, to see if we can not push some of those concepts forward uh, as well. So we're really moving forward. And it was two weeks ago I had opportunity to do a panel um, for the Airline Pilots Association, which is where we got our start. And so having come full circle and have some of those pilots come up and say, wow, you've, you've really added some dynamics that we never thought of was, was very rewarding, I think, for us to be able to say, 
okay, we are moving that ball forward. Professional standards is moving that piece forward. Uh, do you mind playing the, the video for me? So I'll show you kind of an update of kind of where we are in the program itself. Uh, Hi everyone, nope. I'm Terry Bristol, FAA's It'll Chief be the, Operating uh, Officer. Uh, Pro Stands, five year. That's something I'll be talking about later. It's so an we'll exciting that. time for the Professional Standards Program. <coughs> Since the national rollout in March of 2012, it's an exciting time for the Professional Standards Program. Since the national rollout in March of 2012, the program has grown by leaps and bounds. They have trained over 800 committee members in five years and currently have over 500 active committee members in air traffic facilities. Those committee members have processed well over 2,200 cases and counting. Of those cases, over 90% have been successfully resolved. Even better, the rate of recurrence for an issue is about 5%. I'll do that math for you. For every issue that gets submitted to professional standards, over 85% of the time it is successfully resolved and never recurs. The momentum is continuing to build, and the national workgroup members are now passing the torch to the next generation of air traffic professionals. Uh, we were given an opportunity to create it, and we took our time to create a good program. And I think people recognize the, the benefits of it, the value of it, and I think there's only upside for the program from here out. I'm excited about this transition stage because they're gonna be able to bring things to it that I have never even considered. And so, I get excited when I think about what they're going to have the ability to do. In May 2017, the three new FAA management workgroup members, Irene Willard, Haven Melton, and Robert Stone, along with a host of dedicated air traffic controllers, participated in the week-long professional standards training, including NATCA's newest lead on the program, Josh Cooper. These new members share the enthusiasm for the potential of the professional standards program. I think it's exciting. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to help make change, bringing in new life, new ideas, new members. I thoroughly believe in the program. I know what we can achieve if we can build that trust. Um, the things that we can accomplish are just amazing. We have information to show us that the peer-to-peer -peer, um, conversations have been successful in a lot of cases. I'm excited to be able to um, answer questions, uh, train managers, encourage managers, and really just get out, get the word out. I'm looking forward to just getting out there and, and spreading the word, getting people to participate in a program that has a lot of potential. It's been around for several years, and I think that it's only getting bigger, better, and stronger. There's a couple of new things that are coming up for opportunities and um, professional standards. We're, I think, getting much more integrated into the ATSAP side of it. So we, we will actually take submissions from the uh, event review uh, committees to, if they see an issue that, uh, that gets submitted through ATSAP that has a professionalism component, uh, we have created a, a, a conduit from the uh, ERCs to professional standards where we will take those issues and process those pieces uh, through the, through the committees as well. It comes to us at the national level and then based on the content, we, we assign that, that particular work. So I think that that's something that we can, we can continue to expand on because I think it's, it's, it's a great opportunity. Um, but we're also beginning dialogue to kind of create a, something similar to the CISP that, that Steve was talking about, where we will have the abilities to submit um, pilots into their uh, particular professional standards programs and a pilot who has a professionalism issue with us will be able to submit into our program as well. So um, we're looking probably at uh, September, October timeframe to begin some of that dialogue with uh, ALPA, uh, SWAPA and some of the, uh, some of the other air professional standards groups to, uh, to create that as well. Thank you, Garth. And um, Jason and Jay, this morning we did a fireside chat with uh, Patty and I with uh, Mr. Uh, our Administrator Elwell and Terry Bristol, and we talked about the hiring work that we have worked collaboratively to get uh, more focus on, certainly uh, placement and movement in the facilities for personnel, and the next piece of that is what our bigger focus is right now and has been for the last several months, which is training, and certainly training has that component that you guys bring to it. It's very important for us to be better at it is the human performance, human factors piece. Thank you, yes, so good afternoon everybody. I know I met many of you last year and we talked about training and we went through some of the human performance um, 
perspectives on training. Um, I'd say we're probably the, the, the infants in the group. I think we're the newest program sitting up here. Um, and we're still working our way into discovering, I guess, what our full role is. But training is definitely an area where we are being pulled upon um, by many facilities. Uh, when I came to the agency in 2011, I may have spent this last year, but I was very surprised by the, uh, the amount of money we spent on research and human factors and the amount of that that actually went to the operation, that actually affected the operation. Um, and you'll hear us talk about human performance because that's what we're trying to do in our team. It's not to understand what affects people, but how do we change their performance? How do we make people happier in their jobs, more efficient, more effective, better trained um, to do that work? And I think the last couple of years we've been sort of storming. I would not say we're in the norming phase yet. We still don't fully understand the scope of our, our remit. Under different leadership, we, we are still understanding our, our role. I think about two years ago, I described us as the uh, Gordon Ramsay uh, team because we were basically sent out like um, Hell's Kitchen or, which, or no, night, Kitchen Nightmares. It was go to that facility and come back and tell us why is that facility not working? Why do we give him, they got the same number of staff, the same training, the same things we give into every other facility, but this facility is on the radar for poor pass rates or safety issues. <clears throat> and I think we nearly always come back with professionalism and performance. It's we go into that building and we see something that's not working the way it should do. Um, I think we see a lot of uh, managers across the agency, not as many leaders as I would like to see. Because um, some of that is, us, is having those difficult conversations with people to actually challenge the, the professional standards. Um, and that's not just on the operational controller side, that's on the manager side. And so right now we're involved with a lot of training issues. And I think that's, we're often seeing a lack of, um, I guess, willingness to challenge certain behaviors, which aren't necessarily good training behaviors, and therefore they prevail. And they end up becoming the ingrained culture in that building, and they end up being the way we do it. And it takes sometimes the outside folks to go in and sort of ask why it is. So we're trying our best to bring science to the operation, but really to guide performance as well at the end of it. Um, I'll leave you to talk about the standards, I guess. You can bring in what we're doing there, and I'll come back to that one. Oh, yeah, so we, Jason and I have spent a, a ton of time up at a small little facility on Long Island called the New York Tracon. And um, <laughs> they, um, about four years ago, uh, the fact rep there, Dean Acapelli, and uh, the manager at the time came to Jason when he was working in um, Next Gen Human Factors office and said, you know, we need help with our training program. The washout rate's too high. What can we do to fix this problem? And so Jason, having come from uh, the UK, you might have noticed that, um, <laughs> he, they, they had a, a training program there that, that used benchmarks. In other words, so many of you will be familiar with the fact that your first day on the floor in training, your OJTI grabs a dash 25, the training form, and that's also the certification standard, right? So from day one, when you begin training, you're being measured against a certification standard, right? And so there is no, there is no benchmark, there is no scale along the way for by which you are to be measured. It's all subjective based on what your OJTI or frontline manager thinks you should be at at any given time in your training. So through a very painstaking three-year process, we came up with um, standards, right? So things that you should be able to do to be a certified controller that all map back to the Dash 25 and the job task analysis that's a, that was originally done uh, by outside contractors and, and AGI2, and then um, you know, determined that at 30% of your hours given a position, uh, you should be at this point and be able to develop these skills with some level of proficiency. And then again at 55% and then again at 80%. And so um, in our efforts to deploy those that are in, and you know, get them going at the New York Tracon, um, there, there are staffing issues and resource issues and many other issues up there. And for two years, we just haven't been able to do it. So we took them to Orlando, the Central Florida Tracon, which is a much smaller facility, about 45 people. And we got them up and running there. And they've been using them for about eight months. Um, we're going next month to go do kind of a, I don't want to call it a validation because we're really not validating it per se. We're going to talk to folks and see how's it going, what do you like about it, so on and so forth. And um, uh, I think we have um, uh, Abigail and Jeffrey's support to try to figure out a way that we can put these um, into the, the NAS in a, in a larger context, right? So the idea being is that, you know, we're going to eliminate many, and, and what comes along with that is, from our perspective, a, a and Jason mentioned that we're, we're in the culture change business, and if there's, you know, we're all, all of the people on the stage are in the culture change business. Um, you know, changing culture of training 
you know, from hitting people with strip holders way back in the 90s when I came in to trying to understand the different way that people learn, right? Because not everybody learns the same, you know, and, 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 and put that human factors training in people's minds as they go out on the floor to train this next generation of people who have totally <laughs> learned differently, by the way, right? So all the folks that are being hired these days have been have been taught a different way than many of us gray-haired people, right? So they've been taught to a test, they've been taught that they only need to pass a test, and then they can forget about the information. Well, everybody out there knows that air traffic's not wired that way, right? So everything you learn in air traffic, you've got to remember for the next stage to go on. And that's kind of what we're seeing is happening out there, is that, that that's where some deficiencies are, are propping up out there in, in the field. Um, uh, the other, the other part of, of that, what we're working on too, is, um, and this is back. So we get, kind of, like Jason mentioned, we get kind of pulled in a lot of directions. So that's the training piece, but we're also in the safety piece, right? So um, we do a little bit of work on this too. And one of the concepts that him and I talked about early on was resiliency, right? So um, many, many, many years ago, we talked about what, what is the problem? What was the thing that caused whatever it was to go bad, or the thing to happen, or the incident? But what we wanted to do is turn that question on its head and say, what are we doing every day right that's keeping the system safe, right? So where, where is the system being stretched and pushed and pulled and everything else, but the things that we're doing that are going completely unnoticed, how do we catalog those or look at those in a way that people can learn from them, right? So now let's not, let's not get down to the, to the incident and say, oh, it was human error, right? Whole other conversation about that, but let's, what are we doing right that's keeping the system safe? So that's the one part of it, and one of the things we stumbled upon, or at least I did anyway, is this concept of um, catatonic complacency. Right. So um, it takes ten thousand hours. About is that right? Do I get the number right? About ten thousand hours from when you become a journeyman controller to the point where you are considered an expert at your craft. Okay, so during that time, you're extra vigilant, you're paying attention, you're learning along the way and all that. But then when you get to that point where you're now good or the best at what you do, what happens, right? You have a tendency to, to sit back and relax. It's kind of like, you know, you're on a long trip and all of a sudden things are going by you all day long in the car and you don't notice them. How did I get to this exit? I thought I was there because you're not paying attention. You're really, really good at it. Same thing happens in our professions as well, and that's where this term catatonic complacency comes in from. When somebody gets to a certain point where they're really, really good at what they do, they have a tendency to not ask, what's next? What am I looking for? What did I miss? Where, just the complacency piece. And that adds to another concept that we just started talking about, which is drift, right? So where in the system does these types of behaviors cause a facility to migrate away from their standardized procedures and the best way to do business or the best practices. I mean, sometimes it could be just a bad procedure, and you know we have ways to identify that. Steve can do that through ATSAP if enough of it happens. Um, but but what is the cultural drift component where you know things can have lean or put more risk into the system? Um, and so, could we, uh, there's a, a video there, can we play that? This is just, I mean, before we play real quick, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to make a parallel between monkeys and humans, okay? That's not what we're doing here, all right? This is just for fun. The final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. <coughs> So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. <laughs> and so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. 
So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now. Gets again cucumber. the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. Okay, so uh, extremely entertaining. If anybody, I challenge anybody out there to see that that's not a control room in the system somewhere. <laughs> Anyway, uh, the, the, the point being is, is that that's a biological reaction, right? And we are biological creatures, and we do things that are hardwired in our head without sometimes even thinking about them. Um, and, and that's where, you know, the, the, the safety aspect comes in. And you really don't get that information until you talk to people, right? And when that's one of the things that hit Jason and I have really, really taken a liking to is a thing that we're doing called the uh, safety culture assessments. Yeah, we're at, um, we went down to Tampa last year and actually did a safety culture assessment where we really get in and talk to folks and try and understand what is actually going on. And you may see some of that rolling out this year and going forward. Um, basically, the people who know the information are always the ones working directly with the traffic. Um, you may see, two investigations. We're trying to get more um, data from investigations. Because we have an assumption out there, and this one I'm going to kind of close on, I guess, which we tend to assume that when we do things, we do them for the best reasons, because we're competent, we're well qualified, we're great, and when someone else does it, they're the numpty, they're the muppet. You know, they didn't know what they're doing, they're an idiot. And yet, if you ever think about driving along your car, now I'm sure everyone at some point has picked up that cell phone, and we know we shouldn't do it, we picked it up in the car. When you look over and you see someone else do it, you're like, I can't believe they do that, that's so dangerous. <laughs> when we pick it up, well, it's just a quick look. It's just because I need to do this, I just need to. So we justify this stuff to ourselves. The point is that we're all professional drivers when we're out there doing our best. So when you actually ask someone really why they did things, you'll find out what was going on in the process that made them look like they're being unprofessional when they're actually doing the best job they can with what they've got. Now, we're, we mentioned already we're a stretch resource. We've got a lot to do this year and going forward in uh, training and safety. Um, you may see over the next six, 12 months, hopefully, some requests for um, finding people out in the field who are passionate about human performance, who are interested, who are qualified human performance people out there. If you are in that camp, we would love to know who you are because we need to be leveraging you guys out there across the field because we're a, t a small team of about six people right now and we need to know people out in the operation who are doing human performance or interested in it. So please let yourselves be known to us. Good, okay. With that, I think we're gonna go to what Steve already talked about a little bit, which is our uh, uh, professional uh, partnership for safety group. And Chrissy? So the Partnership for Safety, uh, a couple years back, I, I came into, a few years back, came into the, the program, didn't really realize the, the enormity of, of the impact that this program has over the field. So it's, it's really been, been an eye opener and an awakening. And as you can see, all, everyone's passionate about all their programs go through. A lot of this information comes into the Partnership for, for, for Safety, and we kind of kind of oversee really the LSCs, the local safety consoles. The, the, the LSCs are really your committees at the local levels. They're they are, they are the ones that are really doing and making this impact out in the field through the information that's provided through these systems. Also a lot of the accumulation of information that's provided through the different briefings that come down that occur through with the webinars and then become part of your discussions for your facilities. And that's all, all the, uh, the, the information that's provided down. Very important aspect of it is the fact that we, we provide you with so much 
data that I, as I sometimes believe people become overwhelmed because they don't know the enormity of the impact of the differences that they can make with this data that we provide down to the field. A lot of work and effort goes into accumulating that data and, and, and putting it into, the, into ways that you guys can actually access this information and make a difference. So these committees at the local level promote many things. So some of the indirect uh, and I'll start with that one. The indirect uh, aspect of this is these committees are working with with uh, collaboratively. So it's a word that even though we haven't used, you can of course obviously see that we're all working together on both sides. That way we can get the, the proper expertise and the proper knowledge to go into these things. And we provide you with the information, which is the accumulative information that comes from, from the other programs comes down. We are able to obtain a lot of the trends, a lot of the, the, the local facility information to be able to provide you as far as those clusters, uh, that you get those traffic clusters so you can address certain issues and certain problems within your airspace. Um, a lot of the ODO uh, information. We're always expanding uh, the site through which we provide uh, our uh, this data through our safety portal. Uh, and this is all a wealth of information that you can obtain through those local safety consoles. And we do it in this way because this way we can kind of uh, protect a lot of the information that's in there and through that information that's protected, these people can actually go and access that information as needed so they can address the various issues as per whatever your facility decides to really scope into this group. So the wealth of knowledge that goes into the systems to develop this and the enormity of the information that goes to the impact that this is going to make to your facility is something that you guys really need to go out there and discover. Make contact. If you're not part of your local safety council, this is a way of, for you to make a difference being part of these groups uh, within your facility area to be able to, to contribute to the changes that, that, that need to occur, you know, to fix some of those clusters, to, to, to address some of the rootings. And again, you know, the indirect uh, uh, aspect of this is the fact that people are working together, so therefore they communicate better. When they're in these groups, whatever the group is, people tend to communicate better. This also carries outside of those local safety con uh, councils, because now people are talking more, people are interacting more, so they address themselves differently. So people take off those hats and it's no longer, you know, a management bargaining unit or a management whoever is working uh, together. These are people working at the same level, looking to resolve real issues and making these changes within their airspace. So I, before I take over here, I'll give Chrissy a chance to. <laughs> yeah, so you, you hit it, you know, it is about um, identifying and mitigating safety issues at the local level. So that's what Partnership for Safety is. And we do that through the local safety council. So. That's what Partnership for Safety is, the support for the local safety councils, um, support, and we have the tools, we offer them as well. So we mentioned that's the safety data portal. Uh, so that's the portal that um, MITRE, the MITRE Corporation is heavily involved with. We work very closely with them. Um, and that's, uh, they can look at ATSAP reports, they have uh, radar data, they have weather data, uh, a lot of things, and we're constantly updating and working with them just the latest and greatest that's out and available, we want it available to the facilities as well, right? So that's the best way to put all the information that we can in the hands in, at the facility, the people that can work the, the issues the best, uh, the frontline employees that are working uh, it every day. Um, the other tool that we have uh, access to, the LSCs have access to, is the ATC Info Hub. Uh, so that's where LSC members can go and they can um, work I call it like an online workbook where they can keep track of what they're working on from their last meeting. So LSC should be meeting once a month. Um, so they can go on there then, at, you know, and look, um, see what they worked on last month, if they had any tasks. Um, and if they so choose, they can then publish what they've worked on, their mitigations, what they're currently working on, and share that with other local safety councils. Um, so it's a great search tool. You can, if you're starting to look into military operations, you're having some issues, do a search for military and you can find what other LSCs have published in there and you can, you know, so you're not having to reinvent the wheel. You can see what they're working on. Uh, so that's a great feature there. Um, that's where we house also our uh, national monthly telecon. We do a telecon every month. It's the third Tuesday and Thursday of the month. Um, at least one LSC member from every facility should be on our national telecon. Uh, monthly and that's where they get um, we provide national material 
for them to then discuss at their following month's uh, safe discussion. So every facility, I, I know not a lot of hands were <coughs> risen when we asked the question before, but uh, every facility should be um, participating in the uh, safe discussions at the facility. So we provide uh, national material for that and then you can add any local issues that you have. And it's a face-to-face, -face. you guys should be talking. Um, you, know, I, you know, I say this a lot during our national telecons. Um, it's not just to give uh, the operational personnel the information, it's also to, to receive information too as an LSC member. So whether you, um, you know, even in the smaller facilities, if you don't work um, the closing shift, let's say, or you don't work the midnight shift, and you talk to someone who does and there's an, a safety issue and that, that's where you, you can get that information there. Or if you're in a larger facility with multiple areas and you're not aware of an issue uh, in another area, that's that face-to-face -face discussion that you can get uh, that information and that feedback and take it back to your local safety council uh, meetings um, there too. So. so I like to say a lot of times that, that I, I find personally that you're higher performing uh, facilities usually have a high performing LSCs and that's that's true for me because that's what I find when I ask the questions and see these facilities that are really performing great when I ask questions of facilities that are not performing so great usually their LSC is not active or not as active as they should be because this is a mandatory process by the way uh, but but uh, you know you don't get the same kind of feedback or the understanding and we are here to help you that's what that's what we do you know you're feel free to ask questions to us anytime you know reach out uh, whether through the sort NACA sources whether through the program office I mean we're here to help you at any time with what your needs are but these groups are for you and for the betterment of your airspace your facility for you guys to really make a difference with the information that's being provided again a lot of time and effort we take your feedback. Our, our portal grows and changes and, and, and simplifies from the feedback that you give, give us. As a matter of, if, if any of you have the opportunity to attend uh, CFS, uh, we usually have a breakout. We have a, a, a demo area and stuff where, where you can actually see you know, the portions of the portal uh, and see the information that's included in there. And, and talk to your, to your local safety councils. Also, the people participated, and they can give you an idea of what they have on there if they know, but they have to be involved. It takes that level of involvement. So safety really doesn't be belong to us. We're safety, but it doesn't. It, it, we're all safety, and safety belongs to all of us. So you know, a lot of times, what I hear the most is we don't have time for that because of the operation. Well, you know, think of that differently. You know, make time for it so that you have a better operation, so that then things don't happen, and you're doing avoidance of those issues. And if, of course, if you never get into those bad issues, then that gives you more time to do other things that you do. But safety is actually, you know, something belongs to all of us. We can make a difference from what we have. We're providing you with the tools. We just need you guys to utilize and understand what you have and do something with those tools. Did you have a video you wanted to play? Uh, yeah, there's a, this, so this, just a quick, couple minute video shows a success story from Salt Lake uh, from the local safety council. The local safety council is key in increasing efficiency and productivity in your facility. Harnessing the power of all tower, TRACON and control centers in a nationwide collaboration between NACA and the FAA to empower those in the field and give access to the information you need. Listen to how the council is making real change in Salt Lake City. We've been involved with Partnership for Safety for uh, over eight years. We've worked on a lot of projects. The way we work traffic, we have mountains on both sides, so uh, we're really restricted in the valley for north and south, and so it's very difficult to pull aircraft out when they're on uh, inbound on final. So we work extensively uh, with the tower, also uh, a group with the TRACON, to make sure that we could come up with some safe ODO procedures. And it, it was quite extensive, but. In the long run, uh, Partnership for Safety was really helpful. The ATC Info Hub is a powerful tool that can help you resolve issues quickly and effectively. Had a couple of situations where we were um, conflicting with arrivals and departures with the operator out of the Ogden Airport when he was climbing through our departure corridors. So we used the Info Hub, we looked up at what some other facilities were doing and we were able to 
nail down some procedures to make it, uh, I think, a lot safer. With your help, Partnership for Safety will continue to be an effective resource now and in the future. We're able to collaborate, bring ma management, NAFCA together, the people that actually work and are affected by change, we're able to bring them in a room and give that input and we come up with much better decisions. And I think as time goes on, the controllers are getting much more relaxed and used to it and they know if they want to see change, they can go through this process and it seems to work uh, quite well. Local safety councils and partnership for safety. Local minds, national safety. So I think, you know, that pretty much, you know, says it all for us. Um, you know, it just it talks about the tools and, the, and it's a partnership, right? So partnership from us too. We've worked with everyone um, on the stage and many other groups and it's a partnership within the facility and you heard him it's also a partnership <coughs> from gathering information and ideas from other facilities as well so uh, we hope to continue that going and, and really get the momentum going we definitely you know Jeffrey mentioned some outreach and we would definitely like to get more involved in outreach and going to facilities and talking to people and and spreading the word um, and we hope that you guys can do that too uh, for us uh, with about partnership for safety and local safety councils and you know um, Ernesto mentioned it we are a resource that's what we're here for in partnership for safety um, you know anytime if you need help with scoping documents for your LSC or just want to walk through one of the, the safety data portal just to look through the dashboards uh, things like that so so those are just some of the initiatives. Oh, did you were you saying something? No, uh, uh, that we have under the foundations of professionalism. Certainly, we didn't talk about turn off, tune in, and we, you know, the fatigue mitigation world is part of this as well. Because uh, I want to have Garth introduce our newest initiative to the to the group and talk a little bit about that, about that, the Respect campaign. So the the Respect initiative is a collaborative initiative that was actually just launched last week, and you've probably seen some of it on the FA homepage. You'll find it on the NACA page as well. Um, but it's actually a process that began over two years ago, and we recognize that there's a significant safety impact that comes from our interpersonal relationships in whatever our work environment is. Uh, in the nearly 2,500 cases we process in professional standards, about 80% at a minimum of those issues are some kind of conflict. Um, either conflict between two peers, conflict between a controller and a management official, and that can actually be a conflict between a controller and a, and a stated operation or procedure that causes that, and certain conflict between us and a, our customer or our user. Um, and so I think we all know what we shouldn't do, right? We all have a book out there that says don't do A, don't do B, don't do C, but human nature being what it is, if I were to tell you don't do something, your, your first inclination is to, to think of a why you should be able to do it. Um, and so we didn't want to do a negative message about what we shouldn't do. We wanted to make it a positive message. What should we be doing? And so that was really the benchmark for where we sat down two years ago and said, how do we, how do we create this initiative that's, that's positive? And if you go to the next slide, I know that's a little bit tough to, to read, so I, I apologize. Um, but the gist of our goal is to say, if we understand each other, if we work to have empathy for each other, in the workplace, we can build a safer system. I mean, we all work with people that we don't invite over to our house on Saturday night for dinner. Uh, we have people that we have philosophical, religious, political differences with. But what we have to make sure is that those differences don't impact who we are as professionals. So how do we build that understanding? How do we find ways to combat that physiological reaction that we have sometimes to conflict? How can I turn that into a cognitive reaction instead? Uh, and, and, you know, their, um, the, the monkey video is, is classic um, for sometimes what we see out there. That initial reaction, that physiological reaction, we, we can change that. And some of the recurrent training, that if you saw the last iteration, was actually also designed to back up what the Respect Initiative piece is when, when, when I helped craft it uh, as, as part of that. So uh, it was initially a very large group. It was FAA-wide. It included... Uh, every line of business, uh, all the, the unions involved at the time, AFSCME, Age, PASS, et cetera. Um, there was a decision at some point to constrict that and just do it from an ATO perspective. Uh, so a decision was made to try it out at three different facilities, uh, Potomac, Tracon, Fort Worth Center, and Phoenix Tower. 
one in each specialty, one in each service area. And we went out and we helped them craft their respect initiative for their particular facilities. So what you're going to see over the course of the next several years is what we learned from those particular facilities. And so we're getting, we're actually training some of the resources, hopefully uh, at the end of next month, to help individual facilities push out this initiative whose goal is to say, I may not like you, I may not agree with you as my peer in my workplace, but I have, a, I have an obligation to the profession and, and I, I should have an attempt to understand who you are and, and how do I respect your, your professionalism as well. And you know, you, you hear a lot of the, the same comments about where we're trying to, to go for that. So one of the first things we did was we tried to define conflict a little bit differently. And if you could go to the next slide. This is how we define conflict in our particular workplace. It's a lack of understanding or empathy that is caused by perceived or actual differences in goals, abilities, or values between work, people working together. And every single conflict that we have falls into that. It's that lack of understanding or empathy that I have for you. And I'll give you guys a great example that I guarantee you has happened to you in real life. How many of you have ever gone to a restaurant and had horrible service? Your hand. Don't be afraid. Um, how many of you have had that experience and then had the server come up to you and say, I'm sorry, today's my first day? How did you feel? I had empathy for them at that moment. Sure, because we've all had a first day, right? We've all had a first day at the job. And what did you say? What did you say to them when they said, today's my first day? You're doing okay. Five minutes ago, you were probably had some choice words, or you're getting angry, or that person's not getting a tip, right? But the second we took the time to understand or have empathy for them, it changed our perception. And so this is that piece for what we're trying to achieve. How do I understand that person, who they are? May not be my background, may not be my beliefs, but if I can transfer that into an empathetic or understanding piece, I change who I am. And that's really what we're trying to do as part of the respect piece, is, is getting to that point. Because if we can do that, we're going to have a lot less impact out there. Um, those of you who, have, who know me know I love to tell stories. And um, one I told in recurrent training, I don't want to repeat. Um, but there's another story that I think most of you haven't heard. It was one of the first things that we dealt with in professional standards. We had an FAA tower um, transferring information to a non-FAA facility. The transferring controller passes the inbound information to the receiving controller. They come off the line. And almost immediately, the receiving controller comes back on the line and starts shouting. Hey, hey, you can't do that. Pick up the line. And they say it in a way that uh, is not respectful. Uh, and the transferring controller hears that, and they don't pick up the line. They wait. Receiving controller continues to shout, getting louder and shorter on the, sh over on the shout line. The transfer controller continues to ignore that um, because what they're perceiving is a lack of respect from that other controller. And I, if we've all experienced it in our workplace where we perceive a lack of respect from the people that we're working with, and it has a physiological reaction. In this case, the controller stopped listening, didn't pick up the line. What they did do, though, was ship the aircraft to the other frequency. Now these two gentlemen sitting to my right could talk all day about the human factors piece that went into this controller's mind and, that, um, and the result of what happened because when he transferred the aircraft, what he did not catch was the bad readback on the frequency. At that point, he uh, picked up the landline, was talking to the receiving controller and realized much to their chagrin that it wasn't an attitude, it wasn't a lack of respect, it was panic because the clearance that the aircraft was on was gonna put them into the terrain IMC. And the receiving controller was frantically trying to get a hold of the controller to change the route. First thing the transfer controller says is, um, I shipped him, isn't he there? No, because we missed the readback. So, and I always feel empathy with these two controllers because you know as a controller that's a long, that's a long time was they're both trying to get a hold of the aircraft. Fortunately for the system, the aircraft got the right frequency, came over to the receiving controller's frequency, got a revised route and went about his way, never having realized what happened. Now those two controllers didn't know each other, 
They never talked to each other. Their facilities were over 100 miles apart. But that perceived lack of respect caused a certain reaction. And so what we're really trying to achieve with this organizationally is to say, how do I make sure that I work to understand you? Again, I don't have to agree, but if, if I can get to a point of empathy or understanding, it's not going to impact my professionalism, and ultimately it's going to make the system safer as part of that. Um, so a lot more to come out about that. Like I said, it was a, it's an initiative that we just, we just officially pushed out last week, so we'll continue to push that. I do want to close this particular section with a video uh, that Paul Rinaldi and Terry Bristol um, uh, created uh, to push this particular initiative forward. Hi everyone, I'm Terry Bristol, FAA's Chief Operating Officer. And I'm Paul Rinaldi, the President of the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. We're here today discussing the importance of maintaining a respectful, collaborative work environment. And we know a thing or two about that, don't we, Paul? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, simply put, by giving respect to each other, we're earning respect for ourselves. Uh, this is true in our private lives as it is in our professional lives, especially in an important aviation safety environment that we all work in. And that's why we were so pleased to announce and launch the RESPECT initiative. With the RESPECT initiative, our goal is to establish and support a workplace that creates an environment of mutual dignity, support, and respect between all of us as we work to protect the national airspace system. And our goal is to engage in meaningful conversation, followed up with helpful resources that offer solutions for you and your facility. This creates a more enjoyable working environment, but also has a huge impact on the bigger picture. It allows us to work effectively together as a team to focus on our important safety mission in making our operation the best it can be. But it isn't always easy. <laughs> Absolutely not. But it's okay to have differences. It's how we handle those differences that's so critical. When we face personal and professional challenges, we must strive to demonstrate respect towards each other. Professionalism and respect go hand in hand. When we're intentional in treating each other with respect, we can better focus on our mission. We can learn from each other and move forward together. So with that, we're gonna open it up for a little question and answer session. We have a little bit of time if we wanna have somebody. I have one mic here, so I'll hand it off to people that wanna ask a question of the panelists. Where did the RESPECT initiative come from? Was it from ATSAP? Where, where did it start? Um, I don't know that it came from any particular place um, individually. I think it was just a recognition through uh, a lot of input sources that we, we could do better, right? We could, we could improve on, on, on where we were. Uh, certainly ATSAP was a piece of that, I think, in, you know, in, the, in the dialogue for recognizing that professionalism and human factors um, there's a component there that we could, we could touch on to, to address. Uh, in professional standards, we recognize that the majority of our submissions were from that as well. And I, and I think from an agency side, there was recognition that there were some challenges uh, or opportunities to improve at the facility level in, in, in human behavior and, and, and how do we do that. Um, I wouldn't say that, it, again, what came from any particular singular source, uh, but I think it was a recognition overall that we had a lot of input that was saying, okay, there's something else that we can, we can, we can work on. I've got a, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, and, to, and to add to that, uh, on the management side, there were a lot of um, uh, reports and things like that that we saw of um, some of the conflict between individuals. Uh, those number of incidents uh, went up. So when those conversations first started about developing something like that, the bottom line was we, we saw just more uh, conflicts between our employees and facilities. Um, that reminds me, I, so I'm thrilled that this RESPECT um, initiative is coming out because I was actually on the receiving end of, um, as a manager from a, from a controller, it really created a horrible work environment and it was very challenging um, to try to work through it. And the, and the union and the management of the facility really did come together to try to resolve it between us. Um, but it was definitely a, a respect issue. So this is 
fantastic to see it coming out. Um, I have a couple of questions, one's for ATSAP um, and then partnership for safety. Um, for ATSAP, have you seen very many um, complaints or filings about um, supervisor cross aisle? And if you have, what have been some of the recommendations that you've put out if you're able to share? <coughs> I mean, there have been some reports, and that information gets sent back to the facility, so the facility is aware of what the report, what the reporter or the submitter has, is saying. But overall, I mean, that's <laughs> unless you get a whole bunch more and you start seeing it as a trend, and there are safety issues attached to it, which some of them had that, but you send it to the facility and they address it, or they don't, um, and the reporting goes down. It kind of changes how the ERC acts. There were, I don't believe there are any recommendations out of an ERC. One, they won't do a recommendation. If they find a safety issue, they will send it to, in that case, I would probably go to AJT, or the Vice President, to Glenn Martin, and he would have to address that through his line of business, or service unit. Okay, but for right now, you're really not seeing, seeing it come There's through. not a trend. I mean, every once in a while, sure, you'll see a report. Okay, so um, people, you need to start filling out your ATSAPs on that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. a problem, it's a problem. Yeah, okay, great, I'll be taking that back. Um, for partnership for safety, if the local safety council, the energy and the drive and the desire is there, um, but if you're having trouble to get a functional local safety council, um, can they contact you for help or can you come to the facility to give guidance? Uh, absolutely, they can contact us. Um, you know, if we could go to the facility, we would. But definitely we can get a telecon together, we can do go-tos, we can do everything we can um, to, we want that, you know, that's what we're here for, so definitely. Okay, and then, can I get a copy of the monkey video? <laughs> <laughs> it's on YouTube. Great. I think everybody wants an early shove. That, that's the benefit of being the last group. Huh? That's the benefit of being the last group. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, thank you for joining us today. And, oh, we do have more questions. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm gonna hand it to you. I'm not gonna let everybody go. Hey there. Um, let's see, I wrote it down, so hopefully it comes out correct. Um, I think this is for, is it Jason? Um, you mentioned something, mentioned something, oh, actually both of you, you mentioned something about benchmarks and um, you also made an example of like the Dash 25s for people who are training um, yes. and how, you know, there's an improvement toward that. Um, but then as we're talking about professional standards and so, someone also mentioned something about facilities that um, show a need for improvement, like you all went to N90, not talking about M90, but um, do you have similar benchmarks for managers, new managers, long-term managers, and whatnot, especially in facilities like that that are showing that there might be something a little bit more? That's not something as of yet we've, we've been asked to look into. I mean, this was particularly about training standards for trainees to progress through. Um, I guess no is the answer to that question. I mean, right now we have the TradeCon training standards. We've been asked to develop the on route and tower versions. Um, as we do this work, we've been asked about OJTI competencies. Um, and I guess with that comes like training management, but we haven't gone there yet. Um. Um, and then what you said about uh, managers versus leaders, I'm very glad that you said that on this stage. It's very important. We got a lot, and don't get me wrong, that we have lots of great leaders out there, but we also have got managers we need to help transition to being leaders so they can actually make some of these changes because. We can make recommendations, but it's the local people have to make it actually happen. So, uh, question about the uh, respect initiative. Um, I've only been in five years, but uh, it's been probably the biggest thing I've had to cope with is the amount of yeah unprofessionalism. The you know, and I see it on both sides of the line. I see it on you know the old curmudgeonly guys who have you know a couple of years left, and they just set in their ways. They they don't want to bend or mold. And then you know, we have the younger guys who are you know you can do anything with an app brick. So <laughs> yeah, I mean we would follow the book, but with you know within reason, we're all, we're willing to you know just go above and beyond for the pilots, even if it takes you know bending the rules again because it's just it's just a phone call away. But um, how, how is the respect initiative going to be rolled out, so to speak, to where you can see some solid change from it, or is it just going to be posters in a facility that everybody's going to walk past and, and, and not pay attention to? 
Uh, no, today's it. This is we're this not is doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, you realize you're talking to the guys with less than two years in, right? <laughs> two years left, the old curmudgeons. I mean, this, that's these guys. Where are we out? Uh, so there's there's a lot of. There's a lot of things I, I want to respond to in, 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 in your question because there's, there's a myriad of, of, of particular issues. It's a rabbit hole. <laughs> we, and, and no, that's okay. I appreciate the opportunity to respond. So we recognize that it can't be a poster or a cedar briefing or, or something that you simply watch. It's, when, we, when we started this dialogue, um, uh, we were very clear that if we want to change that culture, it's, it's going to take four or five years at a minimum to be able to change that, that concept because it has to be constant. And so um, what we're creating is basically a workbook for every facility to be able to, to go back to. Uh, we're training resources that will act from a district level. They'll have probably 10 to 14 facilities that they'll, that they'll act as a resource for um, and help that facility go through that playbook. And that playbook will include how do we start the initiative at the facility. Um, we've got follow-ons right now that will last at least eight months. Uh, into, the, into the process, uh, different things that different facilities can apply to enhance that respect piece. One of the things that, uh, <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about Fort Worth Center and Phoenix Tower. Fort Worth Center, what they do, and this will be part of the playbook too, when there's a new employee in the facility, the fact rep and the ATM sit down with that employee and talk about the importance of respect in the workplace. So it's part of the indoctrination for a new person coming into the facility. 30 days out, um, Within 30 days, they have a local requirement that the area rep and the area manager have to sit down with that employee and re, reinstill that dialogue about respect. And then they have a three-month follow-on where they, where they do it again. So we'll talk about some of those things, that new employee indoctrination. And that, that's actually known as a moment of socialization, kind of when somebody new comes into a profession. That's where you can make the most inroads into a, a culture change. Uh, Phoenix Tower did something that we'll include as well, and I thought it was very important. I was at their facility as they were pushing it out, and a group setting, and what they asked the group was, we always talk about what people do wrong. We'd like each of you to talk about a moment over the last month or week where you saw somebody around you do something right. And it was very powerful as the, as the room went around and said, you know, I saw this person do this. And, one person even said, look, I saw somebody trip and I saw somebody go over and help pick them up. So it doesn't just have to be work-related. It can be uh, something on a personal level that, that really goes to what we're trying to, to do. So it will be a playbook <clears throat> at the facility level that we're going to monitor to make sure that every facility is engaged in it to, to apply those particular pieces. Um, there is certainly there is certainly an, an age challenge out there that was created and, you know, and, and as a result of this, the strike. And you know, the, we have a significant portion of the workforce, myself included, uh, exiting next year. I think there were 1,200 controllers born in 1963. Um, and you guys can do the math, that's next year. We'll be 56 out, so 8% of the workforce, you guys are gonna be fine. Um, <laughs> don't worry about it, everything's under control. Um, but the dynamics and the psychology between how do I deal with that person who's going out the door and somebody coming in is entirely different, but professional standards can teach that as well. I, I would argue that somebody who's very close to being out the door is the easiest person to, to change. I could go into how I would do that, but I don't know if we have the luxury of that time. Wow. Great. I don't know if that answered your question. Have a year. Have a year. I'm talking about here. It does, yeah. I mean, uh, changing, the, uh, changing the culture is something I'm you know, I'm kind of interested in, I'm a newly appointed NACA rep from my area, so uh, some of the problems I've been seeing is, uh, is why I asked the question, so I do that. So the, a person who's getting close to retirement, the easiest way to, to, to talk to them is you have to understand who that person is. The thing I always encourage people to do is pretend you're them. What is it like to be that person? And for somebody who's getting ready to go out the door, that's, they're, they're getting ready for a divorce. They're getting ready for a loss of a family member. That's what it's like. And so if you know that that's occurring, psychologically, those people are preparing themselves for that separation. And so what happens internally is we say, I didn't want to be here anyway, because it makes the separation easier. So if I can convince myself that I don't really want to be here, then when I'm not here, I don't go through as much psychological pain as a result of that separation. So that's why you tend to see people who 
are getting close to the sunset of their career, I think acting, why did you say curmudgeonly, I think was the word they used? <laughs> um, because they're, they're circling themselves with the defense mechanism. And so when I'm dealing with that person, what I ask them is, you know, you're going out the door in 20 months, right? Yeah, it's gonna be hard for you, right? Well, no, you know, how many people do you think you've trained over your career? Well, 30. You th what did they take from you? What are they gonna remember you for? Is this facility gonna celebrate with you before you leave or without you after you leave? <laughs> so in your 20 months, what, what kind of legacy can you leave? Do you want them to say, man, I remember sitting down with Garth, he taught me this technique, let me teach it to you. Or do you want them to say, hey, I had this old guy training me, don't ever do this. Right? Um, and so when you put it to them in that way, and you understand that concept and you empathize with their position, you can really make a change in, in behavior for that. Um, same thing with a young person. You know, where do you want to go? What changes do you want to make? And if you look at people who are successful with change, it's those people who understand the system that they're operating in and, and operate in those confines, not somebody who says, I'm going to push back against that to make a change because that, that never gets us anywhere. So you have to understand what their goals are, empathize with their particular situation. And once you understand who they are, then you can make a significant change. And that's, that's kind of where, where, we're, where we're headed for that. Again, thank you for being here. And my question is, is there going to be this initiative or program of respect? Is it going to share information with maybe the accountability board, with the model work environment? Because I think their challenges are just that. People just don't respect each other. Um, we're not going to compete with the accountability board or EEO or those kinds of things. When we first started the dialogue, they were part of the conversation. and we. we there's a lot of legal impact from A, B, or EEO issues that we're not, we're not going to touch. So rather than, you know, those environments which are, you've, you've crossed the line now, how do, we, how do we adjudicate the particular infraction? This is how do we prevent the infraction from occurring to begin with? Um, so I want to make sure that we're separate from that concept because EEO and A, B have a, have a component to it that I don't want to say that it's, it's not positive or that it's a negative. It, it's just, it operates in a more of a punitive environment. And so I don't want to make that connection that one is, you know, joined together with the other. So we were very careful not to do that because I think it makes a, sends a wrong message to that. Um, so if we're successful in respect, you know, hopefully their workload goes down. Um, but we're trying to get out in front of something as opposed to, you know, um, saying after the fact that, Here's the outcome. That's what we did with turn off, tune in, right? We, you could increase the punishment, but then you're, you're reacting to the risk once it's already into the system, right? So our goal is to mitigate the risk from ever appearing in the system in and of itself. So I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, but. thank you. Very nicely done, Garth, and all of the panelists, very nicely done. And I, and I do want to end it with one thought. Um, while the respect campaign is focused on the individuals and respect to each other, I think all of us as we belong to our different organizations, um, it's been no secret that when Paul and I were elected uh, nine years ago, our goal was to uh, embrace a culture change with collaboration, reach across organizations, be part of organizations, realizing that we might not all agree on everything that our organizations do and say, but we respect each other. And I think we're all gonna grow better together and be stronger together if we have that respect for our individual organizations. And with that, before you leave the stage, I don't know who's a member of PwC and who's not, but certainly, welcome to join PwC. And maybe next year you guys will come